Hello and welcome to Caldwell County Today. I'm Paige Counts, Public Information Officer for Caldwell County. Today we're outside the Robin's Nest and I'm with Shelly Boland, Executive Director of Robin's Nest. Welcome Shelly. Well thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Shelly, you, this location is fairly new for you. How long have you been here? Let's start that since we're outside the building. I, so I have been the Executive Director of Robin's Nest since June of 2017. Okay, and how long has Robin's Nest been here at this location? Um, they opened their doors in 2010, so it's been a, it's been a minute, but um, we have grown, developed, and uh, the sky's the limit for us. Big picture, tell us, what is Robin's Nest? Robin's Nest is a place for kids to receive hope and healing after receiving some type of maltreatment, whether it's uh, physical abuse or sexual abuse. So we have um, great working relationships with law enforcement, Department of Social Services, the school system, the DA's office, and so forth. And we work together to do the very best that we can do for these cases while keeping the children and their family at the center. It's a very important bit of work that we do. It's a very important bit of work. And let's go inside and you can show us around a little bit. Of All right, great, stuff. sounds good. Now we're here in your lobby. It's very warm, it's very friendly, and my eyes turn to Winnie the Pooh. I'm a, I will admit, I'm a Winnie the Pooh fan, so you have things like this throughout this building to make the children feel comfortable. We absolutely do. We want them to feel like they're not coming to a doctor's office or a uh, police station, that they're coming to a home away from home. We want them to feel comfortable. We um, also do therapy here, so they're going to be coming back and seeing us, and we want them to um, come into the building and say, oh, I'm home, I'm in a safe place. So we go to great lengths to make sure they feel that way. And talk to me about the number of children that you're serving on average. So we, we say on average we see about 200 children a year, but we have seen a, um, an increase in those numbers, just to kind of put that in perspective. Uh, for the calendar year of 2018, we saw 186 children, and for the calendar year of 2019, we saw um, 239 kids. So that's quite a big difference. That doesn't mean that there are a vast number of children who are suddenly um, experience maltreatment. What it means is that there's more education, awareness, and knowledge in the community. Kids are feeling more comfortable to, um, to report. Um, and we've also built a stronger collaboration with our partner agencies to where they feel like bringing their case to Robin's Nest is the right thing to do for those cases. So all of those things combined um, cause those numbers to go up some. Um, and then we also have the opioid crisis, which has increased those numbers. So kind of a con con um, conglomeration of all those things. And you are doing education in the school system, in we classrooms. Are. Tell us just a little bit about that. So we have a community education and outreach specialist, Angie Gregg, and she is going into the community right now into the school systems and doing a program called Think but I gotta remember it, think first, stay safe. I have my little <laughs> bracelet on. Um, and she teaches kids from kindergarten up to sixth grade. Um, what she's doing is it's uh, based on their age, it's age appropriate, but it provides them the tools to be a voice for themselves, to advocate for themselves and to speak up and to know what may not be the proper way for an adult to treat them. At the same time, we're going into the community and teaching adults. So we're teaching them about uh, ways to recognize abuse. And if you know that abuse is going on or if you suspect that abuse is going on, what do you do? Who do you call? What do you say? We talk about confidentiality. Um, and through all of those things, we have both the children and the adults, both of them being more aware. So together we can create the safest community for our children to grow and thrive. And under reporting is probably a long time problem, but, but that's still a problem. We were talking a little bit before we started filming about the underreporting. Can you speak to that? Yes, so what we know from re, um, studies that have been done on adults, we know that typically only one in 10 uh, children ever disclose abuse. So that means that there are a lot of kids who are not disclosing. Um, these efforts to educate both children and adults, we hope that we can encourage more children to disclose not because we're wanting to, um, you know, to, for, for kids to be abused, we instead want to intervene and make sure that we can stop the abuse and provide help and healing to those kids. We want those children to come forward and not just live, you know, in those environments. Certainly. 
Let's take a look at some of the rooms that you have that are really targeted towards children. Excellent, let's do that. Now we're in the family room at Robin's Nest. And as I walked in here, I was thinking about the ages of the children you serve. Mm -hmm. What ages? So we serve anything from an infant up to 18 years old. Um, typically though, we see between seven and 16. That's kind of the, the um, largest uh, demographic of children that we serve. Um, we try to make sure that our, our rooms are not just inviting for the little kids, as you see with some of our mm -hmm. younger toys, but also for our older uh, teenagers. So we have areas for them to sit. They like to be on their tablets or whatever. And we have TV with um, different things that they can watch and books that they can read and um, notepads. They can color and draw. But we try to make it age appropriate for all children. And that's one thing that I noticed when I walked into the room. While you have the toys for the smaller kids, you do have a really comfy sofa for the older kids to sit on. You've got a stack of DVDs, mm -hmm. um, TV, I'm sure there's probably Wi-Fi around if they... Yes, there is. You know, because I know kids, if they have a phone or a tablet, that's probably what they're going to. That's right, that's right. And speaking along those lines, we also talk to our parents about internet safety, mm -hmm. the safety of social media apps, and how those they can be bringing um, nefarious things into their home by allowing their kids to have access without any boundaries. And a lot of times the parents don't even know what these apps are. So we utilize this as an opportunity to um, educate our parents as well. And I imagine parents need as much support as kids sometimes. Absolutely. How do you help parents? So we do everything from helping them if they, okay, if you envision that a, a mother has been a stay-at-home mom for six years and she finds out that her husband has done something, and suddenly she has to have a place to live, a car to drive, a job, all of these things. We can help them with all of those. Uh, we have a great collaboration with the shelter home, so we can offer them some short-term housing that way mm -hmm. as they work to get themselves on their feet. But aside from that, we're also here with them every step of the way. So if they are ex seeing that their child is acting out, they can call and say, can you help me? We can get therapy for them and their child. Um, we also our uh, victim advocate gives them all sorts of resources um, in the community um, as well as here and just is a an ear for them. She can also accompany them if the case goes to court. She'll be right there with them holding their hands every step of the way. So when a child comes here, they're not just on our case roster for the amount of time that they're here for an interview and a medical exam. They're here all the way until it goes through court, which can be two or three years. And you also shared with us a video that we'll probably show at least pieces of with this show. But one of the things that stood out to me is you have the victim advocate from the time you walk through the door. Yes. So you have that person helping, walking alongside you as you complete this journey. Absolutely. She is their point of contact. She develops a close relationship with every one of the families that we serve. Um, to the point where even after the child has moved on and they're no longer on our case roster, parents will still call up here and talk to our advocate about any number of things. Um, they, the child is now, maybe it's a younger child, and then, then they grow and they're starting to date. What do I do? And you said something about social media mm -hmm. apps. What, what was that about? She's always there for them. We, we have great relationships with our clients through the wonderful work of our child and family advocate. That, I mean, that to me, that is just the hand-holding, the walking alongside, really that does make it a safe place. Yes, it really is. The seeing the look of relief on those parents' faces, they come in not knowing what to expect and just as shell-shocked as, as their child is. And the advocate gives them help and hope and the look of relief, like, oh, I can breathe again. And I'm not the one having to, na to navigate all of these things. I have someone who's helping me, who's telling me, okay, now we're gonna do this, now be prepared for that. It just helps them to feel safe and secure throughout the whole process. And that, that is in itself a wonderful service. Okay, where are we going next? Well, I'd like for you to meet our child and family okay, advocate. Okay, awesome. So why don't we go to her office okay, next? Okay, we will go to her office. Okay. <laughs> Now we're with Carla Engel, and she's victim advocate for Robin's Nest. Carla, thank you for joining us. 
tell us a little bit about your role. We talked about you earlier and you couldn't hear us, but we were talking about a little bit about what you do. So just tell us in your words what you do. Okay. Um, when a report comes into law enforcement or DSS, they call me and send the report in to me. And then I coordinate my schedule between law enforcement, DSS. I have to get a forensic interviewer lined up and the family. So we bring all them in together and we do the forensic interview. After the forensic, well, while the forensic interview is going on, I meet in here with the family, go over a risk assessment, an ACES study to try to determine how we can best serve this family. Um, after that's over and the child comes downstairs, I assist our medical provider in the medical exam. Um, and then we all staff the case afterwards with the family, answer any questions that they have. I set, a, set them up for therapy and any services that the family would need as far as like housing, help with um, electric bills, gas money or whatever, we try to provide that for them. And you really are the family's point of contact. Yes, ma'am. You become their advocate and their voice and you hold their hand from the time they walk through the door until the case is over. Yes, ma'am. Right. So tell me what that journey's like because that has, that's about giving a lot of yourself. Um, the simplest way to describe my job, it's one of the hardest jobs I've ever done, but it's one of the most rewarding. Just being able to provide hope and healing for the families, it's, it's very touching. I imagine you see a lot of great sadness, but as you see children heal, you see a lot of great joy too. Yes. And behind me is something fairly new for Robin's Nest. Yes, ma'am. Tell me who this is. This is Alfie. He's our new facility dog. Alfie, release. Alfie, sit. Alfie, sit. Alfie is from Canine Companions for Independence out of Orlando, Florida. Um, this has been about a three-year journey trying to get him. Um, it's a long process of interviews, and then um, we had to do a phone interview, an in-person interview, and then um, Shelly, our executive director, and myself went down for two weeks and did intensive 24-hour a day for 12-day training. Um, and we flew home with him on Friday. Wow, so he is brand new. Brand new, yes. Um, how will he interact with the children you serve? He will go in once we get him established and get him used to the office. He will go in and sit in on the interviews with the children as a comfort to them. Um, they have been known to just give the children peace while they're talking because a lot of the children come in and they're real anxious. They don't want to talk, but with the dog being in there and just giving them that comfort and support they're able to talk. Um, I will take him in the medical exams with us and then he will be able to go to the courthouse once the case is coming to an end and the child has to testify and he will be able to sit in the box with the child. So really he is about providing comfort for the child. Yes. That is an awesome addition. Say so we think so. <laughs> <laughs> now we're in the medical room at Robin's Nest. And Carla's going to tell us a little bit about what takes place in here and how, when kids come in, what happens here? Okay. The children come in and I ask them to sit on the bed. I do their vital signs, their blood pressure, pulse, respirations, um, temperature, get a height and weight on them, ask them to get a urine specimen. And while they're in the restroom, we ask them to undress, come out and have a seat. So every child that comes in the door gets a blanket that's made by a group um, that donates these to us. So every child gets one and they also get the t-shirt. Um, and then they just sit on the bed and April comes in, well, she's already in here. Um, she just starts from the head to toe. It's like going to the pediatrician or a family doctor. We just wanna make sure that they're safe and healthy. If we have a child that's a cutter, we'll take pictures of the injuries um, just for documentation. Um, April has actually diagnosed a child with uh, diabetes just because of a discoloration in their neck. So it's basically a head to toe check, just checking and making sure that they are healthy. We do a lot of talking to them in here about um, safety. Um, we do STD testing in here. Um, we take swabs and stuff and send that to the hospital. So it's just an overall head to toe check just to check for all sexually transmitted diseases. How do you comfort fears in here? Because I imagine this can be one of the, pl the scarier places in the building. 
Um, April tells them she's going to walk them through every step. She's going to tell them when she's touching them. Um, we don't insert anything inside of the children, like going to a gynecologist or anything. It's more of a visual look. So I stand beside the child, hold their hand, um, just offer them comfort, help them breathe through the process, and just encourage them as much as we can. And another thing, I think we said this off camera, Alfie comes in. He will start coming in, yes. He will yes. start coming in to be here with the children yes. doing this. And you've already had Alfie interact with one child, and yes. how did that go? Um, it went great. Um, the child was very shut down and closed off, and I asked her if she liked dogs, and she initially told me she didn't know. And so when she went in the restroom, I went out and got Alfie and came in and sat down in our chair right here. And when she walked out of the bathroom and saw him, the tears and she sat in the floor in here and started crying and just petting him. And then I took him in the family room and she stayed in there with him. And she started out in the bean bag, um, very just kind of shut off. And within five minutes, she was in the floor with him. So he definitely brought peace and comfort to her. So he's gonna be a major asset to your team. Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Anything else about this room or the equipment in here? We don't do any um, shots. We don't draw blood here, so we always tell the kids we don't do ouchies at Robin's Nest. That's very important. Yes, because every child that goes to the doctor thinks they're gonna get a shot. So we always tell them we don't do ouchies. That, that's awesome, and that, that in itself is pretty comforting. Yes. Before we go upstairs, there's one other thing kids can enjoy here or to kind of get their, you know, a little bit of a break. You have a snack center refreshments yes. for them? So while they're waiting in the family room to get everything started, April, who is our administrative assistant, will offer them a snack or a juice. We have a snack cabinet here, juices in the refrigerator, and then after the child comes down from a forensic interview, every child is offered a stuffed animal. So they get to come over and look at our shelf that we have back here and pick out their stuffed animal. And are your stuffed animals donated? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. We asked for new or slightly used stuffed animals. And they can just call Robin. Someone could call Robin's Nest if they wanted to donate stuffed animals. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We just asked that they call so that we don't have clients in the building. Now we're back with Shelly and we're in the forensic interview room. Yes, ma'am. Tell us what happens here. So the child comes in here with the interviewer. They're the only two people who come into this room. Um, it's being observed um, by closed circuit and I'll take you over there soon. Mm -hmm. um, but the child comes in and sits down, the interviewer sits down, and the first thing that they do is try to build rapport. So they uh, wanna know about that child. Uh, do you play sports? Do you have a favorite color? Do you um, have pets? Just anything just to get them talking. And then we go over uh, what's called narrative practice, where we get kids to think about when they're answering a question, that they start at the beginning and go all the way to the end and give as many details as they can in between. Um, because a lot of times, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had an excited child um, and they're telling you something and they start here and then they bounce here and then they go over there <laughs> and pretty soon your head's spinning and you don't know what in the world they're talking about. So we just get them to figure out how to tell a story in a timeline type of a way. Um, and so we go over that practice and then we bring the ground rules. So. Um, if I ask you a question and you don't understand what I've asked you, tell me and I'll try to ask it in a, in a different way. Or um, if I ask you a question and you don't know the answer, I don't want you to guess, just say I don't know. That's okay to not know. Um, or um, if I repeat something back and I get it wrong, I want you to correct me. Kids are often told they can't correct adults. Right. We make sure that they know they can correct me because everything they say is very important and I don't want to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the difference between a truth and a lie and we um, elicit a promise of telling the truth while we're in this room. Those are very important ground rules for kids. And then we just say, so why are we here today? And that will often open the door. And if not, we can start asking um, questions that are very broad to try to see if, if something will help them to start talking. Um, but we also let them know they're not in any trouble. Um, they are, we're not looking at something that they may have done in the process of their maltreatment that could get them in trouble. For instance, um, in the grooming process, sometimes offenders will 
um, entice a child by giving them alcohol or drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to be very nervous about talking about that, and we let them know we don't care about that. We want to make sure you're healthy and safe, and you're not going to be in any trouble from that. So a lot of things that go on in this room have to do with building that rapport, building that trust, and allowing that child to, to know that this is an opportunity for them to tell their story. And, and, and this question may sound naive, but time frame, is this something that can take as long as the child needs? Yes. So we, I've had, I'm also a trained interviewer. Mm -hmm. I've had interviews that are as short as, say, 30, 45 minutes, and I've had interviews that are two hours long. If it drags on for about two hours, um, sometimes we say, why don't we take a break and come back tomorrow and pick this back up? We try very hard to have one interview um, just so that that child doesn't have to keep telling their story over and over. Um, but sometimes it's in the best interest of that child to take a break and come back. So sometimes that'll happen. While we're in here, anything else about this room or the interview process? So this room is also soundproofed. Um, in the designing, when they were actually going through the construction, they have soundproofing in the walls. This is one of the only rooms that has a full ceiling and not the drop ceiling mm -hmm. so that it can um, keep the sound level down. That way, no one can overhear what's going on, that this child knows that they're in a safe environment and whatever we talk about stays in this room. They know that it's being uh, observed by law enforcement or DSS or whoever else is involved, so they know that, but they know that their mom, dad, aunt, uncle, brother is not going to know what goes on in this room. So if they need to tell us something, they are free to tell us that. That's a very comforting factor mm -hmm. and, and a very good feature and someone obviously had some forethought to make sure this room was soundproof. Absolutely. And I guess now we're going to go look at the other side of the wall where an, the observers sit. Yes, um, we're going to go down the hall for that. Okay. Now we're in the observation room. This is where um, DSS, law enforcement come observe what's happening in the interview room. Correct. So they'll sit in here, they'll be able to observe through the camera system, and they'll take detailed notes. About three quarters of the way through, the interviewer will come in here and say, did I miss something? Um, is there something else that you need me to focus on? And then they'll go back in and finish up the interview. Um, the other thing about this, we use a system called iRecord, so it's very secure. Um, and then what we do to share that video with law enforcement, we have a system called VitaNix that's a uh, military grade protected um, storage capability that they can access through a password and then they can view that, um, that interview from their desk. Either law enforcement or DSS can. And really the recording is so the child doesn't have to repeat their story. Correct. We don't want them to have to tell people over and over. So in the old days before a child advocacy center, they would often tell at school. So they'd tell their teacher, then the school counselor, then the principal, then law enforcement, then DSS, you know, then a um, detective or a, um, the assistant district attorney. There was just a list of people that they would have to tell. Now what happens is if they disclose at school, the teacher makes the report. The um, social worker or the law enforcement officer will make a report to us and we all come here and they tell their story one time. And that's very important for them. They don't have to relive and be re-traumatized on that event. Again, another way of making that child feel safe and Absolutely. protected. Absolutely. Okay, tell us what else happens upstairs. So in a minute I'm going to show you where we meet as a multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm where we have a kitchenette that we can um, have for therapy or our non-offending caregiver support groups. And we have a special room called our self-care room and that's for our multidisciplinary team and staff for self-care. So now I'm, I'm guessing this is your boardroom, your multi multidisciplinary room, if I can spit those words out. <laughs> yes, it is. It's also a training room. Uh, we use it for all different types of purposes, but one of the most important things that happens in this room is that all of the different partner agencies come together once a month for what we call our MDT meeting, which is multidisciplinary team. Um, we have all four law enforcement agencies, um, all of the social workers come, all four of the assistant district attorneys come, 
uh, someone from the school system, guardian ad litem, Department of Juvenile Justice, mental health care providers, our medical provider, our advocate, myself, and anyone else who may end up being attached to a case will come here and we will go over every single case on our case roster. So what we do is we want to make sure that we're all working together and that we're keeping the child and family at the center, um, that we're not doing redundant work, those types of things. So before a child advocacy center came along, uh, if law enforcement and DSS were working on the same case, they would have to get a court order in order to share information. With the Child Advocacy Center, we have a standing order that allows us to communicate. And so that makes a big difference with these cases. And now what we see is that law enforcement and DSS will work a case together. As soon as that referral comes in, they know, okay, now we can work on this and they will work together that whole step of the way. And then the um, DA's office is there to say, okay, before you turn this case in, you better make sure you've done X, Y, and Z. So it makes for a, a tighter case all the way around. And with your social services and your mental health services, I imagine it's a more holistic approach. Absolutely it is. Um, so we have DSS that may um, be making a decision on whether or not they can have supervised visitation. And the uh, therapist can say, this child's not quite ready for that. Uh, we're still working on some things. Give me an, another month and let's check back in and see if it's appropriate now. So we're always making sure that that child and family is kept at the forefront. Another good thing about the, metal, the uh, mental health providers being here is uh, right before a case goes to court, sometimes the parent or the child will become very anxious and the um, district attorney will say, hey, can you guys reach back out? Maybe they finished their therapy mm -hmm. and they'll say, can you reach back out and just give them some more support? And our therapist and our advocate can reach out to them and make sure that they have those supports that they need. And I think it's important to note here that the advocate is with the family the entire journey. That's correct. Uh, and that, that could be up to two or three years after we first received that referral. Um, we've had cases where uh, Carla was asked to go with that family to court and the mother had a panic attack and Carla held her hand, helped her, walked her through that and was able to get her through the entire process. And that child was able to have a much better experience because their mother was having a better experience because Carla was there holding mm -hmm. her hand. And we're going to see another room and you call it your self-care room and that's for your staff and the people on your multidisciplinary team. Correct. And Carla said this was the most challenging, probably heartbreaking and heartwarming job she's ever had. So self-care for your staff has to be incredibly important. It's extremely important. We receive a lot of what's called vicarious trauma. So we haven't experienced the direct trauma that the child did. But when you're hearing the child and the family tell you these things, it's like a wave of trauma that gets washed over you. And you take that on yourself. And there are some cases that stay with us that we will never forget. Certainly. And we have to learn how to process that and how to be healthy and safe for ourselves. Uh, we don't want uh, burnout. Burnout's a, a very serious problem in this industry. We don't want that. We want top quality, top notch uh, professionals helping these kids and to do it for a long time. So I harp on self-care. <laughs> okay, let's go take a look at the self-care room. All right. We are in the self-care room at Robin's Nest and self-care is very important to your employees. Yes, it is. Talk to me about some of the things you do to take care of your staff. So the first thing that we have is um, some wonderful people donated some workout equipment. Um, keeping your body healthy is important for keeping your mind healthy. So anyone on our multidisciplinary team or our staff can come in and work out. We have yoga mats and um, a TV to be able to do workout videos or anything that they want. And we had a board member who actually gave us a Chase Lounge. So one thing that I've seen a lot in this industry is um, an increase in things like migraines and that sort of thing. So if a staff person says, I, I'm having a bad day, my head's hurting, they can take a couple Tylenol, come up here and get some quiet and rest before they have to go back into the grind. Um, what I feel strongly about is that we cannot do for our clients if we're not doing for ourselves. And so we wanna make sure that, um, that not only us, our staff, 
but any of our partner agency personnel can come here and get the support that they need to in whatever ways that that means. And we were talking off camera about being a support for each other yes. and just letting your team you vent to each other. You Me have that too. safe space. Other team members come and vent, and that's so important to, to release some of that stress because you do Absolutely. have a very stressful job. Yeah, and it's not something that you can go to your dinner party and <laughs> talk about. So what do you do? Oh, well, I work with kids who are sexually abused. Well, they're not going to invite you <laughs> very often. They don't really want to hear those stories. Those people who work in this industry, we have a special knowledge and, and an understanding. So we want to be there for them when they need to vent, when they need a comforting shoulder to cry on or um, a place to close the door and scream to the top of their lungs. Whatever they need, we want to be that support to them. Okay. You have more to show us, I know. What's I next? I do. So some of the things that we do um, are uh, support groups. We do a non-offending caregiver support group. We do a teen group. And of course we have our therapy. So we have a kitchenette and sometimes when the kids come for therapy, they bake cookies, which doesn't help our waistlines, but um, it does help them. It's something for them to do while they're talking about their, um, their treatment. Um, they can bake cookies or whatever else that they wanna do. And um, a cool thing about um, adults is you congregate around a kitchen table mm -hmm. when you're talking with your friends. And so we have that same type of an environment where they can congregate around the kitchen table and, and talk and, and be a support to each other. So I'll take you there and let you see that. Okay, great. And with the kitchen, the activity, it's a great way to talk. It is. Not only would the therapist be maybe instructing the child on baking cookies, but it can have a good conversation around that. Absolutely. You're much more likely to talk about something that's really bothering you when you're stirring, you know, mixing the flour and the chocolate chips than you are when you're sitting down in front of someone in a room. So at the table here, we can have um, a group of ladies or um, gentlemen around here as their non-offending caregivers and actually sit here and have a conversation. Um, and oftentimes we have cookies <laughs> or brownies or something. Um, and they can have that sense of um, hominess and security and comfort instead of going into, say, a boardroom and having a meeting there. This just feels a little bit more comfortable. And here, how does someone get involved with your um, groups? So we um, make that known on our website whenever we have a, um, a caregiver group going on. And it doesn't have to just be a caregiver of a child who's come through here. Um, we can have caregivers that uh, DSS has recommended to come in. Um, or if you're a parent with a teenager, you need support. <laughs> you know? um, yes. And they sometimes have problematic behaviors. Um, so you're more than welcome to call up here if you would like to, or always check out our website and see if, if we have anything going on for you. And I'm guessing based on the size of this table and the number of chairs around it, your groups are fairly small. They are. If we end up having a larger group, we will move it over into the MDT, the mm -hmm. boardroom, and have a bigger group there. And then we look for ways to make it feel homier and more comfortable. Okay. Um, is there anything else about the kitchen, the uh, dining room, I guess we'll call it? <laughs> Um, just that it's also a place for staff to come together. Sometimes we'll have staff meetings in here instead of in my office or something like that. Um, or when we have um, other partner agencies come in that want to talk. We've had um, the therapist, social worker, and so forth in here talking about a case, figuring out what the next step for that child and family would be. This is a much better environment than sitting someone sitting behind a desk. Right. So we try to utilize this in a way that feels more comfortable for everyone involved. Okay. What, what is next? We have um, the family room. That's the, the last part of our tour is um, a secondary family room. In case we have um, a client who's here and the next family comes in, we're not done with the first one, we can move them up there. Or we have therapy in that room. Um, a lot of times it's therapy. So you can see kind of how that works. Okay, let's go take a look. All right. Now we're in the upstairs family room and it's a very cozy room. And you said that 
not only is it a family room, but you also do therapy in here. We do. So the therapist will get down on the floor with the kids sometimes, or they'll be sitting up here talking to the family while the kids are on the floor doing different activities. We have bean bags. The kids will come over to our chalkboard and write down certain things. Um, this becomes a very important room for, for healing, as well as a place that we can have a family who has gotten here a little bit early. So we don't want um, two different clients to see each other. We want to keep that confidentiality. So this room is very important for that. Another thing that we have are books. We always ask for either new or slightly used books. Um, we allow children to take these books home. We um, have a basket that we take downstairs for the kids, so that kids downstairs can grab a book. But we believe that books are um, a powerful part of healing. You can kind of get lost in another mm -hmm. world in a sense. So if you have any books that you would like to donate, please let it, think of us. We would love to have them. You've mentioned books. What are some other things that you need at Robin's Nest? So we have um, an ongoing wish list. Um, some of the things that we really need a lot are gift cards. We have families who come here who need to come for therapy once a week and they may not have jobs or um, have the uh, extra money to spend on gas. So gas cards are great. Um, we've had kids who were gonna testify in court and didn't have any clothes to wear and we were able to provide them with funds to get a, a nice suit jacket to wear to sit up on um, in that box. And so those type of things are very helpful. Sometimes the family hasn't eaten. We want to give them some, you know, a gift card to go to Wendy's. Um, maybe the parent hasn't had a cup of coffee and would like a cup of coffee. Um, any type of gift card can go a long way, but especially those uh, either Walmart gift cards that are kind of open or gas cards are, are very valuable. And if someone wants to donate, how do they do that? Give us a call, 828-754-6262. Give us a call. Um, we will schedule a time for you to come because we don't want you to come. We have clients in the building. Um, and you can talk to us about any ideas that you have. You may have a whole different way to help us that we haven't even thought about. And we'd love to hear those ideas. Um, and if you don't, we can tell you on some of the ways that we know that you could help. Shelly, thank you for showing us around. You have a marvelous facility. You're doing a great work. Is there anything that you want to add that we haven't talked about? I will say that the single most important thing I want people to know is that children who come through these doors, they're not broken or damaged. They've experienced maltreatment and with hope and healing, they can go on to live wonderful, productive, successful lives. Um, that's the biggest thing. And I also want us to all understand that it takes our entire community to help children. It's up to us as adults to be there for these kids. They say it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a community to stop maltreatment. And I would like for all of us to come together and make Caldwell County the safest place for kids to grow and thrive in North Carolina. Thank you for joining us, thank you for having us, and I look forward to having you back to tell us more about Robin's Nest. I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to it too, thank you so thank much. You. And thank you for watching Caldwell County Today.